So with that, uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Ken Evans, uh, here on behalf of the MYS firm, uh, representing uh, Startup NV tonight. Uh, tonight, we're gonna talk about position, but first thing I wanna do is go back and see, here's where we are. We spent the last two weeks talking about ideation, which means by now, hopefully you have an idea of what your product or your service is by doing this. Uh, and what we'll do is we'll try to always give you a peek at this so you know on a macro level overall where we are, where we're still headed. Uh, as you can see here, the next few weeks, we'll be talking about position, meaning where are you in the market. Uh, we'll talk about commit, which means getting your resources and everything together. Uh, you'll refine things, meaning your team, your organization, and then last but not least, your launch. And hopefully, this will... Yay, perfect. Okay, so here's what I wanted to go back to very quickly. Uh, hopefully you can see this online. And I asked the question, did you do your homework? This is the homework that I was talking about because hopefully by now you've done some analysis to think about the idea you have in mind. And then one of the things we ended up with last time is we said, turn whatever your idea is into a pitch, a real concise elevator pitch. And we'll come back to that. A reminder, because I see people doing screen captures, that's good and okay. But well, one thing I'll point out is we are recording this, so we'll be able to share this and you'll be able to see this. But at the same time, I'm the same way when I'm sitting in conferences, so that's fine. But again, here was your homework where you came up with an idea, product or service, and then ultimately you want to turn it into a pitch. And today, when we talk about position, we're going to really focus on those last three questions there in terms of what's your competitive advantage, uh, how are you positioned, who's going to buy it, and why will they buy it from you? Uh, once again, remember to uh, check in on your way in. And for online, look for the uh, link in the chat. So with that, let's talk about position. And what that has to do with is knowing your customers, knowing your market. You can have the greatest product, the greatest service in the world, but if there's no demand for it, there's no market for it, or worse yet, if people don't even know you're there, it's, it's all for naught. So the first thing you want to do is some market research. And what that involves is uh, talking to people, uh, it involves going out there and figuring out, is there an opportunity for the product or the service that you've come up with? Uh, in addition to that, who are your customers and what do they want? The bottom line is there needs to be a need for your product. Uh, here's, here's one thing that sometimes comes up in the investment world. Somebody will say, well, there's two or three other people that are doing it. Well, here's what I'll share with you. From an investor standpoint, that means there's a need for it or a demand for it. Now, having said that, that doesn't mean that if it isn't already out there, that there won't be a need for it. What I'm just suggesting to you is that it's okay if there's already a demonstrated need for it. In fact, it can be very attractive. Last thing is how best to set your business up in order to meet your customers' needs and demands. Uh, in a few minutes, Maggie's going to come up and talk to you about uh, Sam, Tam, and Song. I think I got the acronyms right. I always butcher them a little bit. But the, the bottom line is that alphabet suit helps you better address how you're going to reach your market, how you're going to service, what's feasible for you to do. Uh, and with that, let me, let me uh, get some audience participation here. Uh, whether you're online or whether you're in your room, and I'm going to pick on everybody because we've got a nice tight group in here. We're going to start. John, did you already take the bite? Okay, perfect. Okay, great. So you're good to go. So here's what we're going to do. The question I have for you is, is there a market for the product or the service that you have in mind? And all I'm looking for right now is a simple yes or no, or not sure is okay as well. But I'm looking to find out, or if you've given some thoughts to if there's a market what you want to do. So starting with John, is there a market for the product or the service you have? Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. Yes. 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 Okay. All right. Perfect. So everybody. At point, everybody has, well, four people have responded yes also. Okay. So we have four people online that said yes. So the key is okay. 
you've already begun to think about the fact that there is a market opportunity there for you to move forward with it. Now then, in terms of your market research, the first thing you want to do is understand your customers, your competitors, and other indicators. So for example, one of the best things, there's an individual, his name is Shondell Newsom. When I was at the Urban Chamber of Commerce, the one thing he always talked about is, what is the problem that you're solving? Meaning, you know, sometimes it's called a pain point that somebody has. The bottom line is you want to make sure that there's a need or a demand or bottom line, you're taking care of a problem and providing a solution for someone. Next thing, what kind of customer will buy the product or the service? So you want to give some initial thoughts to who your customer is. In fact, let me ask this question. Is everybody your customer? Yeah, I see a few hairs shaking. No, that's good because how many of you heard somebody say that maybe they're an entrepreneur or they're an inventor and you ask them, who's your customer? And say, everybody's my customer. Y'all ever heard anybody say that? Yeah, I see a few hairs. Yeah, I've heard that one too. Worst, I shouldn't say the worst thing, but it's, it's up there with being not such a good idea. You really need to be able to focus on and give some thought to who your customer is. And again, Maggie's going to talk about that a little bit more. In addition to that, you want to give some thought to who is my competition. Remember I mentioned a few minutes ago that it's okay if there's two or three other individuals or organizations out there that are doing what it is that you do, because that shows or demonstrates that there's a need. Now, having said that, how many of you know what a niche is, N-I-C-H? Okay, a few heads, most heads. So I'm going to give you something that I'd like you to write down, because if you remember this, this will help you in business. Ever heard the saying, find a niche, get rich? Five simple words. Find a niche, N-I-C-H, comma, get rich. And you, and you may not be trying to get rich or get all the money in the world, but the point behind it is you're paying attention to the fact that there may be competition out there, but you have the ability to focus and differentiate from whoever that competition is. So again, and those people that are online, I'll repeat it one last time. Find a niche, N-I-C-H, comma, get rich. You can put an exclamation point or a period behind it, the rich part. But if you, if you keep that in mind as an entrepreneur, as a business owner, that's going to help you out as we get through some of the rest of this market research discussion. How much should I charge? You want to give some thought to that. Have, you can have a great product or a great service, but if you either A, charge too much, where it's cost prohibitive for somebody to get your product or service, that's not going to be good. Or worse yet, how many people think it's possible to charge too little? Okay, a few hands are, a few hands are going up. Let me tell you a quick story. Um, when I was an entrepreneur, I started a business myself and I was doing some consulting. And I'll ask this question. I'm a consultant starting my business, and I plan to have my billable rate be $35 to $55 an hour because I was used to making $20 to $25 an hour. So how does $35 to $55 an hour sound as a billable rate as a consultant? Good. For you, that sounds a lot. Pardon me? For you, that sounds a lot. like you, that sounds a I mean, it really does. Okay. Uh, yeah. John says he thinks it sounds low. Any other feedback? How does thirty-five to fifty-five dollars as a billable rate sound? And if, and here's the thing: if I point out, point at you, I may ask your name because I got a refresh name. Hi, uh, Cooper, and uh, I would say too low. Okay, too low. Okay, here here's where I'm going with this. Thankfully, I talked to somebody that had been a consultant and been in business before. Here's what I was forgetting: there's a cost of doing business or operations, and then in addition to that, there's a cost of doing sales or business development, if you will. When you add those two costs plus the cost of providing your product or your sale and add all that together, if you charge too low, you'll do what they say, go out, you'll go out of business out the back door, so to speak. And here's, although I started out with that, thankfully I talked to someone, and here's the key, I even talked to a potential client, and they told me I was 
they told me the range I should be in. Let's just say that when it was all said and done, I probably should have been charging two or three times the range that I was at. So, so the point I'm making there is how you need to get some thought to what you should charge, not only charging too much, but charging too low as well. Next thing, what are the trends in my industry? Meaning, is, are things booming? Are, are things picking up? Is, is there a need for it, not just for you as an individual or people in your inner circle, but other people as well? These are all the types of things you want to keep take into account when you do market research. Best thing you can do is talk to people. You know, I won't read the slide here, but you can see the list of potential people to talk to. And, and that's really important because at the end of the day, I'll give you another tip. One of the worst things you can do is come up with a product or service and be wedded to it, married to it, whatever word you want to say, because you like it. It's not about you. From this point forward, it's not about you. It's about all these people up here or potential people up here that may have an interest in it and more importantly, that are prepared to buy it. So you want to talk to all these people. Uh, you know, I mentioned a couple here, uh, vendors and suppliers in your industry. I know you have competition out there, if you, especially if you're doing something that other people do. But let me give you an example. Uh, I used to do promotions with another business venture with some other individuals. And one of my partners used to always say, all those other people are competition. Why are you talking to them? Because at the end of the day, they may have ideas or insight that would be valuable to you. I'll give you a perfect example since we're in Las Vegas. How many people heard of the Nevada Resort Association? Okay, a couple of hands. For everybody, the Nevada Resort Association is an association that has all the casinos, all the resorts, and peripheral businesses, and they come together within the casino industry and the resort industry to talk about things and trends that are going on. Here's the bottom line. Yes, those individual properties may be in competition with each other, but when it's necessary, they come together as a force to share information and insight. That's what I'm suggesting that all of you do and be prepared to do as well. So take a look at this list here and think to yourself, do I have people or these types of individuals within my network that I can talk to, tap into, to get some ideas about the market research that I need to do for my product or service? And then you need to be able to think about new customers. Uh, this, I'm sure you've heard the term disruptive, disruption or disruptor. The point I'm making here is if somebody's already getting, for example, let's say your idea is bar soap and you think you have the greatest, in fact, here's what's ironic. A couple of Angel and B cohorts ago, we actually had an individual that came up with a soap. And the idea behind the soap is it, it had a rustic smell to it, and the idea, it had an outdoor smell, an outdoorsy smell to it, but you would still think you were clean. Here's the point I'm making. Yes, they were getting into an industry where they were going to have to disrupt things and figure out how to differentiate and get people to buy their product, and their niche or their differentiator was the smell plus the packaging and the way they market it. So what it gets into is, What's in it for the person that's getting ready to buy it? Or if you will, why would that person buy from this potential inventor or entrepreneur or founder versus someone else, even in an established industry? So if it's a new customer, you need to pay attention to that. And remember, features tell, benefits sell. Like that. <laughs> Now then, let's talk about how to do your market research. You know, I gave you that big list there, and what you wanna think about here is, if you had somebody sitting in front of you right now, what are the questions you would ask them in order to get some feedback on your product or your service? And, and this is where you have to have thick skin, as they say, you can't, you can't, and again, what I said a few minutes ago about not being so wedded or married to your idea that you can't take feedback. Let me give you another tip. How many of you think, how many of you think you're gonna need capital rate, and this is for the online people too. How many of you already know that you need to raise capital from investors, show of hands? Okay, just about everybody in the room. All right. So let me ask, Thank you. And, and people online are saying that too. 
So here's a tip for you. One of the worst things you can do as a founder is when people give you feedback, you get defensive and you take it personally. You don't listen. You're unwilling or unable to pivot. Okay. The point I'm making here is you could get a prospective customer to come in here right now and give you an idea for what it is you need to do with your product or your service. But if you're defensive or you're not listening or you're unwilling to take action on it, that's not a good thing. And then beyond that, I can tell you from being in a couple of angel envy cohorts, we had some founders that had some good ideas, but they turned some of us off because of their attitude. And what I'm doing is I'm trying to give you some temp tips or some ideas or hints to think about right now as you're going from your idea to doing your market research that's going to hopefully position you better with potential investors. And with that, market set, how many people have heard the term in online too? How many people heard this term market segmentation? Okay, just a couple of hands. Okay, well, for the benefit of everyone, what market segmentation says is that instead of going out there and trying to conquer the world, whether it's your city, your county, your state, the United States, or for that matter, literally the world, you're going to try to figure out what can I realistically do? But you won't be able to do that unless you have the ability to break things down into what we call your market segmentation. And what this means is when you're doing your market research, begin with the end in mind in terms of who's my potential client, what, what percentage, who are they within the market? The thought you're putting into that is the market segmentation. And you have the target customers. That's ultimately who you're trying to reach. You know, let me give you another hint. How many of you have already launched your business or you're pretty close to launching your business? Show of hands. Okay, we have a couple of hands. So those people that have their hands raised, I'm going to ask you a pointed question. Come back to y'all online as well. Brandon, right? Okay. You're ready to just about launch. Do you have a marketing budget? Um, no. Okay. And it's okay to be on that. This classroom environment, we want to be honest. John, do you have a marketing budget? I do not have a marketing budget. Okay. Just tie it. Do you have a marketing budget? Okay. Let me okay. Keep. Ask Lawrence and Ollie. Thank you. Okay. Lawrence, do you have a uh, marketing budget? You can chat or you can un unmute yourself and answer. I don't know if they can. Yeah, they should be able to talk. Lauren said he launched in New York and then dissolved it to move here, restarted about a year and a half ago, and he does not have a marketing budget. Okay. How about Ollie? Ollie, do you have a marketing budget? And we're trying to see if we can uh, technically help you on mute so you can talk. Lauren says not having the marketing is a big word. Holly says no marketing budget per se, but one hundred dollars every month. Okay, that's a budget. Okay, that's a budget. That's a start. And I don't want to neglect this side of the room. Just okay. So people over here, they're, they're like, no. Okay, here's the point I'm making. Actually, I think the point is already made. <laughs> a lot of business owners, entrepreneurs, and founders, they don't have a marketing budget. And what I'm suggesting to you is already be thinking about your target customer and the ideas to reach them and beyond that, the resources for the budget to reach them. Yes, Brandon. So a quick question on uh, marketing budgets Does that include basically like the cost. Like let's say I'm not going to go today, so I have my call. Right. So I don't have the time on the power that I sit there and yeah, okay. What I'll restate the question for those online. Brandon said that he's in the arena of real estate and he's trying to do a unique service within real estate. Well, in terms of developing his marketing budget, he was asking for the time that he spends, whether it's cold calls or warm calls, should that time be considered in his marketing question, his marketing budget? My answer to that question two parts or two ways. I'm gonna say yes and no, and not so much no, but maybe. <laughs> Absolutely, you should account for the time that you need to spend marketing your product or your service, whether it's taking people to dinner, lunch, coffee, 
whether it's getting on the phone and calling people, absolutely be thinking right now or an estimate for how much time that's going to take. Because where I was saying maybe too is how many of you are paying yourself a salary or have already put in your budget paying yourself a salary? Okay, I'm getting blank. And people online too. Here's the point that I'm making. And this is where I was going with the two parts. Whether Brandon puts his time in his marketing budget, which you should do part of, or whether he makes sure he pays himself as an owner or a founder, that needs to go in your budget as well. Take a real quick humorous story. When I started my company, funds were pretty tight. So literally there were times when I would cut myself a check as the employee of the company, and then I would turn around and go deposit that check in the bank right away to, to keep the company going. But the bottom line was I was establishing the discipline where I thought of myself, even though it was just me initially, I thought of myself not only as a company founder, but as an employee of the company. So that, that's the way I would answer that question there. And the key is account for your time from a marketing standpoint. That's the bottom line I wanted to get across here is because I used to be at the Urban Chamber. Can't tell you how many of our businesses did not have a marketing budget. And beyond that, you may want to jot this down. Start with a marketing strategy. And again, that ties into your target, your market segmentation as well as your target customers. But start with a strategy, and then based on that implementation, you'll come up with ideas and a budget to support it. And, and where I was going with the story is I can't tell you how many times I talked to businesses that did not have a marketing budget, and especially small. And I get it, money is tight, but just get in the discipline of at least thinking about what it should look like. The, the other thing that I, I wanted to suggest on that is the fact that if you don't do it, you're kind of planning to fail because remember what I said earlier, you can have the best product or service, but if nobody knows you there and knows about it, it's not good. And here's the other key thing too. I appreciate social media. In fact, how many of you already have a social media presence for your business? Here, a couple of hands. Okay. Here's one thing that I know that different resources will be able to help you with this. You do need to establish a social media presence because it relates to your credibility. But at the same time, here's the point I'm going to make. Being on social media, quote unquote, is not a substitute for a marketing strategy and a marketing plan and a marketing budget. And with that, we're going to have Maggie. Wait, wait, question, Mike. Is there a, uh, a written, unwritten rule? Really, I've written. I mean, the amount of uh, marketing, you know, percentage of sales or percentage, like, is there a percent? Great question. Great question. Here's the way Mike's question for those that are online is, is there a rule or a written rule that you can use for a percentage that you should apply for marketing, whether it's your strategy, your plan, or within your budget? Here's the response I'm going to give you. There are resources. And in fact, I'm going to use this as an opportunity. Tomorrow at the mentoring session, there'll be an individual here. It's a Pat. Patrick Griffiths, he's a UNLV uh, librarian, but what he does is he helps people do market research and other types of research. The way I'm going to respond to that question is to say this. There is research that you can do within your industry to get a feel for how much money, how much and resources that people spend for marketing and marketing-related uh, subjects. So the, the, the way I'll answer it is to say it depends but having said that, there are resources that you can find out about to help you come up with your strategy, your plan, and in turn, the budget to support it. Oh, good. No, it's okay. You put the check in back up for everyone. Yeah, the, we'll do that. Here's what I'll say. For those that still need to check in, we'll put it in the chat. And then in addition to that, there'll be the last slide for you to check in, plus it's on the back table. Thank you. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Maggie because she is going to talk you through how to do the market segmentation and things to think about as you're developing it. You're going to watch things over there. Okay. Hi, gang. So, Tim, Sam, and Sam, what the heck is that? 
Okay. Tam, Sam, and Tom, these are the numbers of markets. And most people think that investors want to see these numbers, and it requires a good amount of research and work on your own. But I say you should want to know these numbers for you so you understand how big the opportunity is with your business. And if it's not huge, if you're not going to be the next Facebook or Airbnb, you just need to know that. And if you think that there's still going to be enough in this market, that if you work really hard, you're going to have a nice lifestyle, that's fine. But you should want to know what it's going to be like. So TAM, SAM, and SOM, what do they stand for? TAM is the total addressable market. And this is like everything. If all the people in all the world buy your product, what would it be? But this is where we're doing research for TAM and SAM. SAM is always a subset of TAM, and that is your serviceable, available market. So even though transportation might be the whole world, if you're starting in the United States, let's chunk it down to the United States. If you're starting in Nevada and you have kind of a localized business, then let's chunk it down to that. Let's be realistic about where we're going. And we can have a longer term plan. So we're not just going to stay in Nevada. We're gonna go all across the United States. That's fine, then include the SAM. But you want to do the research for you, even if it's not what you share, with your investors, you should still be trying to figure out what's my journey gonna be? Where do I go? I'm gonna start in Las Vegas. Then I'm gonna to go to Los Angeles. Then I'm gonna to go to Reno and Bay Area. Okay, so you need to have a plan. Yeah. Uh, the Zoom IP. Uh, okay, let me see. <laughs> if I copy the invite, well, let me just. Oh, oh, oh. You look okay. Yeah, he was joined on his phone, so he should be okay. sorry. He'll walk it over to you. All right. All right, and then so these two numbers are research, and that's why we have Patrick coming tomorrow night. So he's bringing his computer that has access to all the databases of UNLV, and so he will be able to help you do research. But probably he's going to spend time having you refine your questions. So he may not be able to give you any sort of report tomorrow, but he'll get you thinking in terms of how to ask the right questions to understand your whole market and where you are going in your first part of the journey. And then service, serviceable, obtainable market. This should be a time-bound projection of your revenue. Now that, that sentence, time-bound projection of the revenue, that sounds really easy, and it's not. There is so much research that has to go into this. You are doing financial projections. You are, I gotta let Chris in here. Um, you're figuring out what your marketing roadmap is gonna look like, and then you're doing research on what is it gonna cost to advertise in each one of these cities. Because if you're planning it for five years or seven years, I mean, you're definitely hoping that you're going to progress into other markets. So you have to, and even though like in three years, you don't really know what the ad rates are gonna be in Los Angeles, at least you've done some work, okay? And you have an idea of what it is now. So this song, which sounds like it's like the easiest thing to figure out, it's not, it's the hardest thing to figure out. <laughs> okay, but we're gonna, is there a question? Okay, here are some famous investors from different DC groups like Sequoia Capital and um, Archino and Crowdfunder. And I just wanted to show, this was an assessment of which slides they want to see in a deck and which ones they think are important. And you can see that each one of them wants to understand the market slide. So they want to know how big the opportunity is. So that's just a little validation there. Okay. Are we able to get these slides sent to us after? Yes, let's make a note of that. We'll send you the slides. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. So here we go again. The total addressable market. So this gives context for how big your business could possibly be. And then the service available market, this gives downside risk to the investor. 
So it's going to take you years and years to approach a healthy percentage of the total addressable market. So the investors are wanting to know, okay, what's the roadmap for five to seven years? Like, what is that potential? Is there enough potential for me as an investor to see an exit that is 30 times my investment? And so that means you're going to have to get to a sales level of hundreds of millions and then be acquired by somebody or go public. But you're much more likely to be acquired by somebody. So, and in case you wonder, we have a calculator on our website that will help you to figure out what those numbers are. And you can play with them. And you can see like what your valuation is, what you're starting with your evaluation, how much investment you're taking, and what you would have to get to in sales and an acquisition in order to uh, give those investors the return that they're looking for. Yeah, pardon me, Maggie. Yeah. I would ask the question you're going to do. Uh, it's my understanding. I'm sorry. It's yeah. my understanding that the purpose behind Incubate Vegas is to get individuals to create businesses that are scalable. So, in terms of what you were just talking about, is that what we mean when we say scalable? You may start small, but you want it to be scalable so it can grow enough to be attractive. Right. So, that is scalable means that. It's not going to say just a small business. It's going to be one that will grow and grow and support more employees and stimulate the economy around us by giving jobs to people who can then go in and buy things and buy homes and and just like it's is a really cool kind of uh, ecosystem where a founder. This is what typically happens. Not part of this thing, uh, but we call it the um, virtuous cycle. Of entrepreneurship. So an entrepreneur starts a business, it grows, 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 they get acquired, they have a nice windfall, they've been working their ass off for six or seven years or 10 years. And so they got this nice windfall, they're going to buy a big house, they're going to buy a toy, like a jet ski or whatever. Um, they're going to take a trip, they're going to buy something for their mom. And then six months later, they're going to be totally bored. And so what do they do? They either start another company, or they start helping other startups to get their initial investment because for them, it was such a life-changing event. So this is the virtuous cycle of entrepreneurship. So yes, so Incubate Vegas, we want to help everybody to start their business, but we're really looking for scalable businesses and we're here to support you in that growth. So we're hoping to have a success story from some or all of you sitting here. And even our young school. high school student. Uh, okay, so I got through all of the definitions of these things and that the SAM gives the investor a realistic picture for the near future and not the whole world. So how do you calculate these things? And there are lots of sources for research and probably the most expensive one is external research and most startups cannot afford to do that. The companies that do this are companies that are thinking about adding a new product line. And they can pay it for Gardner or Forrester or one of them. Um, what's that? No, I was just trying to try it. Yeah. Yeah, but, but somebody who is bootstrapping and starting their own business, then here in Nevada, we get to take advantage of the fact that our universities are land grant universities, which means that they are here to service the public. So that means their libraries are open to us, and so are their librarians. So we can get them to help us. And Patrick is great. He really loves to help people. Uh, but I would even say, we're going to get to it, but I would even say you start your own research with Google. You start asking questions of Google to understand the size, and it will tell you some of the results will be like, this is Statista research, or this is IBIS research. And so you'll have an idea when you talk to the librarian where you found research that was applicable to your particular industry. Yes? I'm just curious if you want to be honest with you, I I know there's a car that's been a while on the street here, uh, a couple blocks here, around the courthouse. Yeah. Uh -huh. But which, which, is, which is good, but it's not the same as what was before the general needs. We have access to that. I don't know about the Boyd Law School. I know that Patrick is just in the general university. 
And I believe he also has access to LexisNexis, which is a database that's used for cases. We actually sign up at the Park County um, Law Library, which is a couple of feathers off the top of the building, just a couple of blocks here. Mm -hmm. You can do that online. You can get access to LexisNexis. There you go. Um, which is a very expensive database. Yeah. Um, but there it was just something different about going to a law school library than. So that might be something to answer. Okay, yeah, let's let's ask Patrick to um, okay, so these are some of the other places that you could you could go to the CIA World Factbook and ask your queries of them to see where it leads. The idea here is to try to refine your questions so that you can get very specific industry information. So we're gonna go through a couple of examples that are well known. And then we're going to go through some of the examples that I have seen in the decks that I have observed. Uh, so let's talk about Uber. Uber was, and if you've watched any of the movies that have come out lately, then, then you'll understand. They were just a car service in San Francisco when they started thinking, oh, maybe there's something here. So when they first pitched investors, they looked at transportation as their whole, the town. So they're in the transportation industry, but what does that include? Transportation includes ship cargo. It includes air cargo. It includes lots of things that had nothing to do with the taxi service. So, but that was their segment. And so back then before there were, oh, well, I guess there were a pretty good number of startups back then, but it's at least a good place to start. So in 2007, uh, transportation was 5.7 trillion worldwide. All right, so we were talking about Uber and Tam Samsung. Uh, the question in chat was about what if your industry is mostly word of mouth? I challenge that your industry is mostly word of mouth because social media has reached into every facet of life. And I am pretty sure that you could probably reach your people through social media. If you're on Facebook, I would say look for special interest groups in your industry. I, I don't know what it was, um, but that's where I would start. If it's a professional industry, LinkedIn is probably your best bet. These different social media challenges or channels apply to different sorts of businesses. So the very social fun things are TikTok and Instagram. If your image, if you can do images that are interesting and catch people's attention that way. Facebook is one where you've got a lot of special interest groups, so you can really reach into that group. And LinkedIn is more for professional types of services. Back to Uber. Uh, so I don't know when I took out, so I'm going to quickly review this. So Uber, when they first were presenting back in 2007 to investors, they picked transportation as their market. Their market is really large and includes things that have nothing to do with what they were doing, which was taxi and limousine services. But they started with that segment. If you're really trying to figure out where you fit, you can start very macro and you could look at the segments that make up the S&P 500. So there's different sectors that make up the S&P 500 and you can try to see where you fit in that if you want a real macro view. And then you're going to have to try to narrow it down so that you can understand. Uh, so Sam for Uber in 2007 was taxi limousines at 4.2 billion, still a very, very large market, uh, which is of interest to the investors. And they, they did this three-prong approach for their obtainable market. They figured if they did the best case, they would be a market leader with a billion in yearly revenue. And realistically, they thought they could get 5% of the top five US cities. So they're already in San Francisco. They're gonna go to LA, they're gonna go to New York, Chicago, and the places where we have dense packed cities where people don't wanna walk too far, like Seattle, it's raining all the time, right? But they do have a very packed little downtown area. It's enough that you would want a taxi. So that was the way that they were thinking about it. So Uber's revenue in 2020 was 11.14 billion. Their current valuation, I just looked it up today, is 91.84 billion. Okay, so it's not 1 billion, which they thought was the best case. In their, their revenue was 11 
billion in 2020. I didn't look up what the revenue was this year. Okay, but they have expanded beyond being just a taxi service, right? They do Uber Eats, they do Uber Ski, they do Uber X, they do Uber Freight, they have Uber Scooters. So they have a lot of different things now, but because they were growing and they were looking at different markets, they were able to kind of go into these other areas, make a market where one didn't exist before. Here's another example, Airbnb. So the way they calculated this was slightly different from the way that Uber did it. They actually started in San Francisco. They were south of market. They, they were like three guys and they had an apartment and they needed to make the rent. And they were close to Moscone Center, the convention center there. And so they figured that they could put an air mattress in a room and rent it out during conventions. And that's why it's actually Airbnb, because they used an air mattress first. Okay, so they were looking at how many trips were booked. They figured that their air mattress on the floor was not really a luxury type product. So they were thinking about, uh, you know, budget conscious travelers and the people who waited too long to book near Moscone Center for trade travel. So they did their research and there were 1.9 billion or more trips booked worldwide. Um, I forget what year this was, sorry. Um, so they looked at what was they did the market research, how much was being spent on budget travel. Back then it was 532 million. And then they were figuring out how many trips could they do with Airbnb. So they took 10.6 million trips. I don't know how they got to that number, but they did. Times what they figured their fee would be for booking this. It was an average fee of seventy nights over seventy dollars per night over three nights. Their fee was going to be twenty dollars, so their amount of the market was going to be two hundred million dollars revenue. Oops. So wait, you spent five hundred ten point six million is two percent. Oh, was it two point two percent? Two percent of five hundred thirty-two. There you go, two percent, an arbitrary amount. Um, a lot of times if people tell me that they think that their song is going to be 1% or a fraction of a percent, I usually think that they haven't actually done the research, that they just picked a number out of their ear and gone with that. So I, that's why, for me, song needs to be built, and that's why it's hard to build, because you're doing your revenue projection. Yes, sir. For your uh, TAM, will that always have to be worldwide, or... Can you say, okay, yeah, it, it depends on how much you're going to chunk it down. Like sometimes you're actually going to do like four levels and you need to know where you're starting. So it's fine for the total addressable market to be the United States, especially if you're selling a product that is not easy to ship and it would take you a really long time to develop your business to where you could ship overseas or you have no intention of selling overseas in the United States is, is your market. And then, then you start with your state or your uh, SAM, and then for your SAM is still your sales projection. Uh, okay, so Airbnb, their 2020 revenue was 3.38 billion, okay, not 200 million, <laughs> 3.38 billion, and their current valuation is 82 billion. So they've done a lot. They've moved into the whole world. And, you know, they have some, you know, they've changed their marketing lately where they're really trying to talk to families to, to rent the stuff. They've had their ups and downs with uh, some of their missteps, but still, I mean, 82 billion. Excellent. All right. And if you're trying to go into a multi-sided market, this is difficult. It's where you're trying to make it easy for people to buy stuff from other people. So you have to attract the people who are selling things and you have to attract the people who are trying to buy things. So in order to kind of figure out what your market potential is, if you're going to charge both sides, then you're going to have to look at the markets for both sides. It's challenging. Uh, so here we have a slide of a company that was going to make custom clothing, sell it online. 
So in order to get there, they looked at custom clothing design, which is an industry in itself, bespoke tailoring. And then they were looking at manufacturing and then what's currently happening with sales online because they wanted to marry the bespoke design with the sales online. So they gave a very clear view to their investors that they had done a lot of research and they understood where their customers were coming from in these different areas. I don't know what the conclusion was, but some of 32 billion, some of 27 billion, and some of 24 billion. They're still big markets. Like I said, though, for some, I want to see a projection of what you think you're going to be able to do yourself in five to seven years. Now, here is a much smaller, much more relatable story about a couple of guys who were living in New York and they were sports fans and they loved to go to games and they had this idea, isn't it cool to wear a jersey when you go to the game? Like, but who, who do you think would want to have the jersey? They think, oh, it's got to be the guys that have season tickets. They're the ones, they're going to be totally into the team. They're going to want to wear the jersey of their favorite player. And so they decided to go and do market research. Gary had this plan. We will buy these jerseys, we'll clean them, we'll send them to the guys in the beginning of the season, we'll get them back at the end of the season and clean them. And in case their player gets traded, we're going to make an automatic swap. They get to pick another player that they like. So this was their theory. So in order to test their theory, which is talking to your customers, they uh, went to well, let's see, they looked first and they said, okay, there's 150 million Americans who watch the five major team sports. And how many can I reach with my sales channel? So they figured they're just going to start with New York. That makes sense. A lot of people, very dense, lots of different teams. Perfect. So there are 11 million people who watch the five major sports. And then they went to Yankee Stadium during the games. They talked to people, lots of people, not just season tickets. They talked to everybody they could find. And what surprised them was, I can't even read my slide here. I've got a thing in the back. So 11.7% of the 11 million people in New York showed a strong interest in using their service. What they found out though, was that it's not the season ticket holders who were gonna you know, wear the jersey for the whole length of the season. They found a lot of people who only go to one or two games and they wanna wear a jersey to that. It's like, oh, so what can we do about this? We can send them one jersey before their game, we'll get it back and then we'll send them another one when they're going to the next game. So instead of having a season long rental, they've got one off it. And what surprised them more was the women were just as interested in wearing the jerseys as the guys were. All right. So their last slide was done in a table format. The stacked Venn diagram, that's what this is called, is the easiest way to depict this for investors. So the information from the last slide is put into this uh, stacked Venn diagram. So 150 million people are sports fans in the US. 11 million New Yorkers are sports fans, that's the SAM. And then based on their research, 11.1%, whatever it was, and so it's 1.3 million. So they thought this was their number of potential customers. But this is like I told you, it needs to be in revenue. It doesn't need to be in units. We don't need to know the number of people. We need to talk to investors about how much money we're going to pay. So we take the 1.3 million, and they decided that 60% of them were going to be one-time renters. 40% would rent for the season. They developed different pricing for those two different products. One time was going to be $50 per one-off, still cheaper than buying the almost $200 jersey. And the season rental would be $250. And you don't have to worry about washing it when you send it back. So they figured their revenue was going to be uh, one time $390 or $39 million for those people and $130 million for the season-long renters for a total of $169 in three years. So it's a very logical way. It's very easy to explain to the investor how you got there. Being able to rationalize your thinking about these things is key. 
Do you ever watch Shark Tank? No. Okay. And so in Shark Tank, they pepper them with questions about their numbers. You need to know your numbers when you're meeting in front of investors. All right. Now we have some core examples. Yes, sir. How did that you give them what's sitting like? You know what? There is a company that still exists, but I can't remember what it's called. I've, I've checked up on them a couple of times. So they are still there. But I would have thought that like Chicago also has a bunch of different sports teams. That they would almost be a household name, but I don't think that they are. Yes, sir. Well, if you're talking about sports, since I got my Indiana Uh-huh. Our team is Indiana. Uh-huh. And he is with the broadcast back Because he does a great job in Dallas, and he wanted to see the Indiana broadcast team. In Dallas. That's how I get his foot on the dog. Because he's a Hoosier? Yes. <laughs> he's originally from Pittsburgh, but he went to IU and Bradley. Okay, and but he wanted to listen to the Indiana basketball game. Is every Hoosier a billionaire? I didn't say he was. He <laughs> we are, but you know, Kirk Ronnie did say we need to be the Hoosier. You should have been something very different. Okay. All right, so this was a slide that was in an actual deck. The total available market in professional sports industry stands at $73 billion. This company wanted to introduce a new sport, and their new sport was samurai fighting. Wow. So, <laughs> so uh, they said, okay, so the TM is $73 billion. That's a big market. And they expect to have 7.79 .7 billion in revenue yearly in six years. Oh. So they needed to do more research so that they wouldn't be fooling themselves in this way. The research they needed to do was like, how many people are familiar with samurai fighting? How many people want to spend money to watch samurai fighting? Okay, they need to talk to potential customers so that they're not fooling themselves into thinking that they're going to get 10% of the market in six years. Another sports thing. Yes, sir. Sorry, I have another question. And can you watch your questions on the yes. Back to the, like, you know, the, those people, the samurai people, <laughs> tend to 10% 10 in six years, but they're not a market disruptor, right? Like, you're going in to disrupt the market like uh, Uber did and Airbnb. But when you expect a higher percentage than, the, you know, like, you know, you know obviously 10% is a little outlandish for a samurai club but, or a samurai league or whatever. Because even, you know, like NHL or MLS, I don't know. Right, soccer is the biggest sport in the world, and it's still a really small percentage of the sport right. fans here. So, but if you're a disruptor, like the first two examples, like... Well, for those two examples, you have an obvious pain point. Right when we, we talk about pitch decks, we've got a problem, we've got a solution. So with the problem, people avoid pain and they go towards pleasure. So these are your two problem areas. Um, being able to get around in a city when you want to, that can be a real problem. That's an understandable kind of carotid gushing sort of problem. Whether I'm gonna go watch hockey or samurai sports, that's all discretionary income. It's not a painful problem. That's moving towards pleasure. So, so thinking that they were gonna get 10% of a market is just unrealistic. When you're working on your idea for your business, you want it to be an obvious pain point. And if it's an obvious pain point, you'll have a big market. Uh, so this uh, group, and I have seen this uh, repeated in several different ways where people love a sport. In this case, there were two buds. One was a gamer and one was a hockey player. And they think, oh, okay, all we have to do, we create this two-sided marketplace where we get specialists in these sports to make money by coaching kids. So we get to have them you know, spend 20 minutes coaching a kid and we're gonna take a percentage of what they're charging because they're athletes and they're famous and you know like michael jordan is going to charge a thousand dollars half an hour and 
I can't think of another basketball player, but you know, he's going to charge a much smaller amount because he's not as well known. So again, the double-sided marketplace is very difficult because especially in this one where you have to attract famous people to spend their time doing this. And then you have to get parents who are willing to pay that kind of money for their kids when the sports themselves can be very expensive for families, just outfitting them and getting them to practice. Uh, so this is the way that they figured it. It was 54 million youth athletes in the United States. And then they were going to focus on bantam level male youth hockey players. Okay, so we're starting with units, the number of kids that are doing that, rather than what is the spend for youth hockey in the US. Okay, so that's where they that's where they went wrong there. And then the gamers, he estimated 1.8 million total gamers interested in competitive play. Okay, now you're really pulling yourself here because 1.8 million is a lot of people, but what are they willing to spend? And I know my kid when he was younger, he would rather play on his own than have to like stop doing that and get coaching from somebody else. So this was not a good attempt at market because it didn't research the right things and it didn't put it in terms of income. Now this one was a little bit better. This one was a group of, um, it was actually a brother and a sister and they had like a phone case that cooled the fat. And when we had like phones popping into fire, that was, that was germane. Um, and they started looking at what was the mobile phone accessories market. Okay, that's, that's good. That is right in there. It's a very focused market. And the mobile phone protection cover market, okay, perfect way to get into the service available market. And then we're missing a dollar figure here on some. It's like, okay, <laughs> well, we know where we are so far, but somehow we can't get the work done to figure out what our SOM is. So apparently it's a global untapped market. Well, no, you're gonna have to make some assumptions. You're gonna have to be reasonable in how you were thinking about it so you can explain it to an investor. And then they spell competitive. <laughs> okay, now we have some good examples. All right, this fella uh, wanted to set up mobile hair um, services. So beards, men, it was mostly for men. So he looked at the global hair care and he said the research showed that it was set to grow from 69 billion in 2019 to about 107 billion in 2025. And he included beauty salons. So at first his idea was just for men, uh, but he realized that there's a lot more spend on uh, women's hair fashion. So he did a beautiful chart here that shows the growth and he really had to include the women in order to make those big numbers. So worldwide, 107 billion. Uh, the US was 34 billion and he was starting in California. And so I'm not sure how he got to 80 million, but he did. So he could probably justify it. I think he did and that's why I used it as a baby. Um, 80 million in California is a lot for annual revenue. Okay, this is a very busy slide. Uh, but this fella did a tremendous amount of research to show every possible competitor that could be. So he did research on the market size by adding all of these different things. This fella is a real brainiac, and he created a bed that had gyroscopes, and so it would rotate you. So you didn't toss and turn, the bed sort of tossed and turned. This was also good for people who um, were mostly immobile. So it kept them moving and prevented bed sores. Uh, so he looked at the futon, he looked at inflatables, he looked at adjustable beds, he looked at hospital beds. He looked at the lateral tilting bed. So this one is one that's used in hospitals and care facilities for people who are mostly immobile. And he's like, you know what, even cervical pillows, that's part of my market. So the total all up, the adjustable beds, two and a half billion, the mattresses, 14 billion, the bed and regular mattress and US bedding and furniture. So he's got all of this detail. I don't think, it's a 
and move into the next slide. Yeah, so this no, I didn't do it, but I like his thinking here. And he needed to get to where he was getting to the Sam and the song. Um, his bed was extremely, I think $6,000 it was very expensive. And so there's a very small market for people who can afford that kind of bed that doesn't look like a nice piece of furniture. It didn't, it looked more like a space capsule. So- But is it for hospitals? Was it for hospitals? Like he didn't. Country. He didn't intend it. Like he he put the U.S. market at two billion for the medical stuff, and he figured that was not quite big enough for a really scalable business. So he wanted to he wanted to uh, to appeal to the super rich, small market. But this company was doing telemedicine, and they knew that they were going to start in Las Vegas. So they started with the world, global telemedicine. They went to the US market, 6.1 billion. That's a nice chunk. And they figured they could get to 40 million in about eight years. So they need to have time to scale. Is that? Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, so they were reasonable about how they were doing it and they had a plan for how they would get there. So this is a nice slide. And then here is the same company that Ken was talking about that was part of Angel MD. It's called Outlaw Soaps. And they had amazing marketing. And so this gal, she like, she analyzed the heck out of this stuff and she figured who her people were, who were gonna buy this. Her soaps were like blazing saddles. So they smelled of leather and smoke. There was one called Lust in the Dust and one called Calamity Jane. And so it had kind of this outlaw old dress sort of flavor to it. And she knew that her market was 8% of Americans and it was worth 3 billion. Okay, and so you see this slide, it's like, I'm ready to listen, tell me about it. And so what she narrated with this was that her market were, what does it say? Well, she knows that they were Harley riders, and then they're military, active military, and veterans, the REI people. These are her market and the annual festival attendees. So she had talked to enough customers, and she knew, because she'd been selling for a little bit, so she knew who were the people that were buying and rebuying. And so it was the military folks that were like, they loved her stuff. So... 39 million Americans or 8% of the population. These are relatable numbers. And then she wanted to reach the audience through combination of the targeted marketing, but also going to these festivals where people showed up. So she would be in those places. She's also in Whole Foods. And they went to South by Southwest, which is, you know, it used to be a music festival and that's like an everything festival. There's a whole startup track and yeah, there's a lot going on there. Okay, then she said, now as we move further, we're gonna get into home fragrances. We're gonna make candles. We're gonna send pillows. We're going to grow this business so that we can get into the home fragrance market, which is three million. So this gal had a way to explain it to investors to make it real. Plus her marketing is beautiful. Every time I move my little menu, it won't advance. Okay, here's a summary. So Tam is the big picture. Sam is the more local picture that limits downside risk for the investors because that's more achievable. And then SOM is what you think you can attain in three to five years or five to seven years. And like I said, this part takes a long time to figure out because you're gonna have to figure out where you're going, your roadmap, where are you going to introduce your product next? You've got to do the research on what the marketing costs in that area, what it's going to cost to, like, are you distributing it with mobile salespeople? Will you be able to just sell it into a new market based socially, or just on social media, which is, that's pretty good if you can do that, because then you can have one warehouse where you're shipping things from, and you don't have to spend a ton of time going there or hiring people in whatever the next location is. Some services and software, you're going to actually have to hire people who are going to have to go into that area and sell into the area to 
depends on what your product or service is. Hey, and we always want to see Tam Sam selling in dollars. And here are two people. Patrick will be here tomorrow. He will be probably in the next room helping people to do the uh, research. And then we have our regular mentors who are going to be coming too. But Ken, I'll tell you who that is. Our, uh, Tara is up at UNR, and the two universities do have different databases. So it behooves you to go ahead and write to both of them and ask them your questions because they may be able to give you different market research from different databases. They both have IMS World. Um, some have Statista, one of them has Statista, another one has BizMiner. So it, it is good to ask both of them to see what kind of market research you can get. If you're planning to do an app, I don't have the resource to help you, but there's something called App Annie. There are a couple other services that focus just on apps. And so it can be gaming apps, it can be you know, puzzle apps, it can be social apps. So there are resources out there for you. Okay, questions, any questions on Yes, sir. I have a question. Um, so do margins matter with like the SOM part of it? Like, oh yeah, you know, like, you're, you're okay. doing your actual revenue projection, right? So you know what your cost of goods sold is, you are assuming what you're selling it for. Yes. You may have a couple of different products. You know what the margins are on your different products. You know which product is your most, your best seller versus you know, the other products that you have that don't sell as much, like your best seller may be 50% of your sales. And then you've got two other products and one is 30 and one is 20. Sure, uh, no, I mean, specific to like the Tam Sam song, like if- We're like, just talking revenue. So it doesn't matter if it's 10% or 50%, like- of, of, Well, yes, they are gonna ask that. Like one of the- Not in your particular debt. section. Yeah, yeah, right. So you're just projecting revenue for a song. Okay. Um, then when you get into your business model, what you're charging, what your margins are, that's where they're going to learn about that. Okay. Yes, Can I ask you just to drill down on that a little bit and tell me when you say you're showing your revenue, mm -hmm. is that how much you took in? Is that how much you took in minus? No, just revenue. Time? That's just, just the top line. Yeah. yeah. Not, not. So I, I saw an article yesterday that Rivian is losing 34K per truck they sell. So uh, their revenue would be here, but it's actually not. Right, so in the business model, you're going to tell us about that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, burn rate is, yeah, what your monthly expenses are that you're, that you're not bringing in money against. So you're, so they're like minus 33, right? You're burning 33. Well, that's burn a truck. Like how many trucks are they producing per month? Because it's that times that. Yeah. Yeah. So, okay. Okay. Well, what I said that is uh, mine is spinning now. Uh, a lot of information, a lot of things to think about. Yes. Yes. Um, but when I get a deck in, I look, there's the two things that are most important to me your business model. I let it look, hold on. Get those pens and papers out, which is about to give you a hand here to get money. Well, okay. So, Tam Sam Song, that's important to me. And you can see it was important to all of those other investors, too. So the market size, because again, it lets them know how big the potential is. And then the other one that you won't get past me to pitch to us if you don't have a business model that explains what you're charging, what it costs, and how you're selling. So if it's a software SaaS, software as a service, I, I want to know what you're charging. And if you have different tiers, like you've got premium, and then you've got this much, and then you've got this customer, I also want to know, like, okay, premium, you're not going to make money on, right? So are you making enough money on your other two tiers so that this is a viable product, that you're going to be in business for three years? So business model, TMC, and some, those are the things that I am most interested in. But the first thing that we hear about usually is the problem. And the problem should be readily identifiable. But you know what? I'll be back to talk about pitch decks. Yes. Okay, well, I'll... Uh... So just throwing this out there, I think that she holds it at all and want everything. So like an ideal tail would be something like cyber worldwide market is one and a half to three billion dollars. That's we can see number to see by eventually get by. Sam would be ethical hacking professional services in the United States, and then Sam would be ethical hacking professional services perhaps within Nevada, so that's the gaming industry that's 
federal state local government. Does that does that resonate with you all? Or should I need to apply that to it? Oh, tell, tell me what your SAM was again. The SAM uh, was ethical hacking professional service subset of cyber security at large. Say ethical hacking? That is correct. What is, what is the hacking part about? Okay, yeah. 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 So basically, okay, I can tell you exactly. I can tell you exactly what the pain point is too. So we're fighting, we're fighting cyber crime. Basically, we'll help you identify uh, vulnerabilities. Oh, okay. For bad guys. Yeah. So, and this is a growing industry. Right. So when you're talking about the industry too, it's something right. called compound annual growth rate (CAGR) right. if you can um, If that number is high, it's like over five percent. In your case, it's probably. It's more. Yeah, it's, it's, yeah. yeah, yeah, that that is good for investors. They would like and they know the pain point, right? Caesars Mills MGM. It was both MGM and Caesars. Yeah, some pain and we have to eat. Yeah, yeah, so it's it's a very uh topical problem right now and an expensive one. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, David Navarro said that I'm, I'm surprised. Well, how much my spam is saying the song is the need to hammer out the sales I can expect over five years. Yeah, and it's a guess. You know, this is like planning for war, right? The plan doesn't survive first contact with the enemy. This is true in business, too. All you can do is be thoughtful about your planning and be rational about it. So then if you explain it to somebody, it's like, oh, yeah, I can see that. That's really all you want. Okay, I think I've yacked for a long time at 7.15. So thank you very much. Um, I will be here tomorrow night and able to answer any questions. Patrick is really going to come on to help you. Yeah. Well, so Patrick's tomorrow night. Well, you know what? Chris. Ken used okay. to say. Yeah, I'll cover it. <laughs> they also, they also do. It's so hours long. Yes. Oh, and yeah, this is the first week that we're going to have the um, office hours on Friday. First week. Virtually, and um, everybody has been added. Everybody who signed up has been added to that calendar invitation, and so and that's for the whole series. It's drop in. You're not required, but if you have a question, come in there. And if we find that that Cara and I can't help you with that, then we will refer you to an expert in that field. And tomorrow, the mentors will be uh, Tom Yates is returning marketing. Uh, Faye Almashan will be here. She uh, covered finance. And then we have uh, Kasha Hines. Uh, I think she talked about operations as related to products. And then uh, Neil Baker will be a new mentor as well. What I would encourage, because I want to be respectful of time, is the summary slides I was going to go through just reinforces the fact that right now is the time to think about your big market, subset of that market and then what you can reasonably do as a company and as well as to the point of how are you going to market it how are you going to reach the market who is your market now's the time to be thinking about all that and as you see you know she gave you two foot stompers we used to call them in school your numbers have to tie back to the thoughts that you're having right now uh, yes so, good question so if i need to acquire Something wholesale to sell it. So, I'm okay. Do I calculate that into? So, say it again. Sorry. Yes. Yeah. I need to buy it. So, I'm going to track out the market for the buy wholesale product. Yeah, so you're, you're going to calculate your cost of this sold. You're going to figure out what your pricing is. That's why it's so much work. Because it's like all the financial planning that you have to do. And then not only that, it's marketing planning, sales planning. What's the road map? Yeah. yeah. I just want to add something out. I was talking to the sole versus uh, your margin. <laughs> There's a system over this that I've been for a little while. It's going to be correct in case, but like to share it. Uh, if, your margin, if you want to do the 30% margin, you do not multiply it times 1.3. Divided by 27, one of the 40% margin, divided. whatever your cost of goals up, cost of goods sold are divided by 0.6. So it's the margin you want, uh, minus, you know, one minus the margin you want, whatever percentage that is, you take your cost of goods sold and divide by that. So if you multiply it one times 1.3, your margin is actually not 30%. It's lower than.
Yes, there is interesting math. Okay. Uh, out of respect for time, we're going to wrap up. But what I'll say is we'll, we'll be around a little bit longer than definitely we'll be here tomorrow for the mentoring. Here's what I want to encourage. And this is also on the, uh, the, the, this is also on the summary slides. What I would encourage all of you to do is to start putting, right, start writing out right now who you think your market is, how big you think it is, how are you going to reach them, and then start thinking concretely about what the what the steps are and then what the cost of the steps are going to be to get it done and 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 just start putting that together uh next week we're going to pick back up on we're going to continue the discussion about position and how to position your your company and eventually what we're getting to is some people are asking about the elevator pitches uh we we didn't do those tonight were you prepared to do those tonight okay okay because I, I pointed out the questions, but I didn't give you a chance to do the uh, elevator pitches. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to make a note, and then we'll make sure that you have time, not tomorrow, but next session to do your elevator pitch. We'll make sure that we get that done.